the connection between what we see in Genesis 3 into Genesis 6 and then maybe even to Genesis 14? Sure. Um, you know, I, I once listened to a guy giving the whole Sethite theory uh, view, and one of the things he said about why he takes that view instead of the supernatural is that he goes, well, prior to Genesis 6, there's nothing supernatural in the whole Bible. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. This is literally what he said. I'm like, have you never read Genesis 2? Who do you think is walking around in the garden with Adam and Eve? Have you never read Genesis 3? Who do you think that is in the garden with the woman? You think it's literally a talking snake? Does not the rest of the Bible tell you that it's a supernatural entity? What do you think that that was that he stationed at the door of the gate of the Garden of Eden to cherubim? I mean, it's not like this comes out of the blue. Yeah. So there's your connection, and then there's this prophecy in Genesis 3.15 of this seed war that's coming. And so the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent, but he will bruise your heel. And so this has to find its way playing out somewhere. So I think it plays its way out on a spiritual and a physical level. You know, spiritually, Jesus talks about Pharisees are children of the devil. Yeah, there, we no, no doubt so that, that's true. So there's that part. Yeah. But there's also the physical part of it, right? That, that uh, there are supernatural entities that take physicality in, you know, they, they eat with Abraham, yep. they have their feet washed, um, all kinds of things. They wrestle with Jacob. Um, that's not a metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> it's a WWE match. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, uh, that physicality starts being played out in Genesis 6, and that sets up the rest of the Bible for, for that war. You know, I think that's, that's worth revisiting in the sense that, uh, or, or restating, because what I have seen, and I've been addressing this in a different format, is that exact thing, is that, hey, guys, um, Genesis, you, you can't have it both ways. I think hermeneutics is about being consistent. I think that's probably, the, probably one of the greatest uh, uh, categories is, is this consistent. And so in Genesis 3.15, oh, well, we have, um, we have the, the physical seed of, 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 of Eve, which we know is the physical seed ends up in exactly. Jesus, right? So, and then exactly. all of a sudden, Zerah, the, the, the Hebrew word, it's like, okay, well, here it means physical, and over here it means spiritual. Right. Because it is true in First John. It is. Right? You have the, the, hey, if anybody sins, they're of the devil, they're of the, you know, you know, whatever. So we're not, but we're not denying that there is a spiritual component, you know, that we are by nature children of wrath, Ephesians 2, 1 John 5, children of the devil, with that language is there. But now we're reading New Testament theological language back on the Hebrew of Genesis 3.15, where, no, this is, this is physical. We have, we are, our physical world uh, there's people from outside of the physical, the, the, the world that we see uh, that are interlopers or they're, they're coming into our world. Right there, again, even Genesis 3.1, you have this creature that uh, took the form in the Nakash, right? It took a form of a serpent, whatever, but it was still physical. She wasn't, it wasn't a vision is what I'm saying, yeah. right? It wasn't just in her head. It wasn't just in her head. Yeah. So we have this uh, in the Old Testament through, I think one of the interesting things is in, in 2 Kings 6, we know the passage where Elisha says, Lord, open his eyes to the servant to, right, exactly, to see. Exactly. So there's things that are that are there, but there's there's this realm that's being blocked. Somehow he was not able, his eyes, whether it's, uh, if we talk about the electromagnetic spectrum that he's below visible sight, whatever, however it is, yeah. Um, a radio wave that we can't see is just as physically real as the visible light spectrum of, let's say, 500 nanometers, right? So it's just, it's physical. We just, our eyes aren't able to, yeah, to see yeah. it, right? So you have these other things that are happening. That's why you need a radio telescope. <laughs> it's still physical. Yeah. So to me, this is fascinating, but you also have the foundational thing, of uh, the foundational messaging, the theological mes messaging. Genesis 6 there kind of lays there and, and then we see it. How else do we see it in the sense of the rest of the, the Old Testament narrative? Well, like you said, Genesis 14 sort of starts us off because Abraham comes in the promised land and then his nephew is stolen away and there's this war, uh, you know, that's all going on there. Well, who are these people? Well, if you start yeah. looking into who these people the are. The Rephaim, right? They, yeah. are, they are giants. The, the whole thing is about giant clans. And so... That's actually telegraphing stuff that you'll find later with Moses because he starts fighting or, or hearing about these exact same tribes. And in those contexts, it's very clear that they're giant tribes. I mean, you have the Ammonites and the Moabites that are killing these very same people. 
you know, the Zamzamim, like they appear yep. in both of these places, right? Yep. Well, who are they? Well, they're giants. I mean, it tells you that that's what they Deuteronomy are. Deuteronomy 2 and 3. If you're, if you're listening to this, read Deuteronomy exactly. 2 and 3, and you'll be like, what? I never knew that was in the Bible. Yeah, exactly. You, that you will not. It's amazing, amazing how Moses says, yeah, these guys were there, but they, they got, you know, the, the, the sons of Esau took care of them before. We didn't have to worry about those guys. Yep. But as they come up from the southwest to the southeast up north into Bashan, Og, talk about him for a minute. Well, he's the king of Bashan. He reigns over the whole area of Mount Hermon. The whole area, Bashan itself, can mean the place of the serpent. Uh, the watchers are, and sons of God uh, are serpentine creatures. Uh, they're actually depicted this way in the Dead Sea Scrolls and Pseudepigrapha. So this is a guy who is the progeny. Probably very early progeny. We don't know how early. It talks about king of the Rephaim. He or the last of king, the. He's the last of the Rephaim. Uh -huh. I mean, so this is like somebody who's going way, way back. I mean, there's all kinds of funny legends about him uh -huh. that he lived through the ark, uh, mm -hmm. through the flood on the ark, he and held stuff on. like that. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. And Noah fed him through a hole in, in the ark <laughs> and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so Moses goes into this area that's controlled by him, and he absolutely obliterates him because he would not let Israel pass through. Yep. It's to me what. Uh, it, it, to getting into some of the linguistics, which I think is 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 fun for people, is that what I have found is that if you look at the first five books, uh, uh, you know, call the Torah, the Pentateuch, whatever, Rephaim has a very specific meaning to these phys these physical giants. Now later, as we know, if if you if you look at it from a, like what they what scholars will call a diachronic perspective, later Rephaim has way different meanings. You know, uh, the, the spiritual spiritual people, ghosts, the other words it uses in the Book of Isaiah. But if you look just in the Pentateuch, I don't see any spiritual dead there. These are physical guys. Later, again, the word the word morphs, and I think it's referencing the same beings, but just a different aspect of their location and their and their existence and their existence. Yeah. yeah. So, so Rephaim is, is this word, first appears in Genesis 14, but it's foundational here, right there, because it sets the tone. Let, let's, in, in the last couple of minutes here of this segment, um, how does it set the tone for the rest of the Bible, Goliath and, and the biblical history? People don't realize this. I had, a, I had a fellow I was teaching this to in a Bible study, and he had just had brain surgery, and uh, he would fall asleep every time I talked about this subject. Um, we might talk about this later, about some of the weird reactions people have to this. I mean, okay, some yeah. people get viscerally angry. And well, his re reaction was to fall asleep. And he wouldn't do this at other times. Finally, I just looked at him and said, man, what are you doing? What is your problem? He goes, this is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I said, really? I said, don't you believe in Goliath? He goes, well, yeah. I said, he's a giant, right? He said, well, yeah. I said, you ever looked at his lineage? Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? Well, th this got him because he loves genealogies. Okay. okay. <laughs> and uh, I mean, he's one of those kind of science math guys uh -huh. and he loves them. And so I said, well, go look into it. You'll find that he's descended from the Rephaim who are Nephilim. Yep. And as soon as I said that, light light went off in his head. He got and it. And he it, it clicked on and he became the greatest apologist for giants that I've ever seen. I mean, he just absolutely saw how important the subject was. 